Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here because I think uh, I'm bringing questions mostly for you to help me answer. And uh, as Paul has said, I have worked in astrocytes in the so-called gliophil, although it's a bad name. I think it, we wrote uh, an article last year that was a little bit controversial about stopping to use the word glia because glia is a historical name uh, that was coined one century ago when the neuroscientists that were very bright at the time, like Ramon y Cajal, describe the brain as being composed of neurons and the rest. So the rest is just glia. And that rest is astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, vascular cells. So all of them are very different. And they are as different from each other. Oh, excuse me. They're as different from each other. You're typing this, but that's real life. Uh, they are as different from each other as they are from neurons. So it, the glia name had a meaning one century ago, but now it's totally meaningless. I, I, I try myself not to use it, but I have to use it. But just, just to make the point that it doesn't make any sense to have two types of cells of the brain, neurons that are already very specialized themselves and the rest of the brain. That, that's really obsolete and we have to get out of that framework. So this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about the anatomy, um, the <coughs> excuse me, the I have a hoarse voice. The anatomy and the molecular profile of astrocytes. And I'm very fond of myself on anatomy and molecular analysis because they tell us in an un unbiased manner, keyword unbiased, about the function of the cells. Because we can have hypotheses, but in order to elaborate educated hypotheses, we need unbiased data. So anatomy and molecular analysis tell us a lot about what the cells do in the brain. Then I will talk about homeostasis, which is the realm of astrocytes, where most of the people have worked in the past uh, century. And I will move to talk about astrocytes and behavior. I will describe many studies that show that astrocytes contribute to complex behaviors and higher brain functions. And I will divide that part in three parts. I will talk about calcium, which is to astrocytes what action potentials are to neurons, a real time functional readout of cellular activity. Um, I will talk about some papers that I think they're key because they use very special techniques so that you have very interesting concepts that link astrocytes with behavior. And then we will move to the <laughs> computation, which is where with this is your part and I, myself and the field wants to move astrocytes to computational neuroscience. So the point is that we think, the astrocyte field thinks that astrocytes should be actually studied in system neuroscience as an integral part of neural circuits. And I send you a paper, I'm sure you didn't read it. We just submitted this paper last August. Um, it was an invited review to GLIA, it is under revision, but they asked us to think about these problems, how, how to study astrocytes in system neurosciences and in computational neurosciences. Perhaps you don't know the authors, but uh, Ruben Moreno Bote, it's uh, from Pompeo Fabra. He's, uh, he works in decision making. He's, <coughs> excuse me, he's in uh, computational neuroscience. So he, he, he's the neuronal person. Maurizio is a computational person. And the rest of us are from the astrocyte field. And the key questions that we asked in that paper, and I, want, I would like you to help uh, us answer them. There are three. It's like, if computation is an emerging property of a given neural network, this is from Rafael Juste, do astrocytes help to shape sharp such property beyond providing metabolic and homeostatic support? Second question, do astrocytes encode by way of calcium transients? And the third question is, if they do, what they encode? So I will raise those questions at the end of the talk. And during the talk, I will post different questions and either we'll talk about them or you raise another questions 
that you want to talk about or we wait until the very end and we discuss everything together. It's up to you. So I will adapt to the uh, dynamics of the class. So this is the traditional and I think inaccurate view of astrocytes. This is the probably the view of astrocytes that you have. Astrocytes like stars. The one century ago, Cajal drew this beautiful picture of a tap of cells of the brain that have a small cell body, very long processes, and they send also processes that are called amphi and that touch vessels. And since the cells look as, like stars, they were called astrocytes. Then, one century later, this view of astrocytes like <coughs> excuse me, like a star-shaped cells was confirmed by immunohistochemistry because antibodies against a protein of the intermediate filament of astrocytes, the glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP, was developed and it helped us to identify astrocytes in all possible models. Here we have in whole brains, these are human brains, and here are the astrocytes in cultures with immunofluorescence. So GVP immunostochemistry, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it works very well. So GVP antibodies are excellent. They always work. The students love them because they always get data. And we have identified astrocytes in many different situations. So they have given us a lot of information. But on the other hand, they have given us a distorted view of the astrocytes because they stain the cytoskeleton, which accounts for less than 20% of the cell body. So GFP immunohistochemistry is like an X-ray that reveals the bones, but not the flesh. So, and the flesh is very important in astrocytes. So it's just recently that we understand how real astrocytes look. And this happened with the development of soluble fluorescent dyes that can fill the whole astrocytes and reveal the whole cell body. Three technical advances have been necessary. First, the discovery of the green fluorescent protein and the uh, use of this protein for biological studies. Second discovery, the development of viral vectors that are able to put this protein in cell specific in, in specific cell types in the brain or in the rest of the body. And those viruses are cell specific because they have two features. One, the plasmid that they transduce into the cell types have cell specific promoters. In our case, it's GFAP or variants thereof. And the tropism of astros, of the viruses. In our case, we work with adeno-associated viruses, AAV, serotype 2, 5, or 9, that recognize specific receptors on astrocytes. So this is a setup. I want to give you a sense of the kind of experiments we do. This is a regular setup. We, the mice under anesthesia are set up in a stereotaxic frame. We open the skin, and then we do um, injection of the viruses in a very precise localization draw depending on whether we want the, the viruses to infect astrocytes in cortex, hippocampus, or other, other nuclei in the brain. So this is an image that I took myself, a coronal section. After, two weeks after the injection of the viruses, we can see how the fluorescence has spread around the injection sites. These are to the injection sites in the somatosensory cortex. And in green is a low magnification picture of GFAP field astrocytes. In the case you see that they have, this, they have moved to the cortex and they have moved also to the hippocampus. But usually we don't sacrifice the mice to, to take these pictures because the beauty of the glyphorescent protein is that we're able to see the astrocytes in vivo. And this is the third technical advancement that has allowed us to see the real astrocytes to photomicroscopy. To the left is a cranial window. So the animals, after the viral injection, we, we close the skin, they rest in their cages for two, three weeks until the virus transduces all their materials. And then we take the, the animals and we do, it is exactly a window. So we, we, 
we cut with a microtome, we, 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 we cut the skull, we do a, a, round, a round figure in the, on the top of the head, we remove the skull, and then we put a cover slip, and we glue the cover slip with, with dental cement. And that stays there. If it's a good window, it really stays there all the life of the animal. Sometimes they, they remove it, and we have to place that again, but this is actually stable. And then we take the animal to the two photo microscope, and we take a look of the glymphorescent protein. So these are the real astrocytes. They are not like stars. They're bushy cells. They have uh, cell body, primary and secondary processes, and most importantly, they have a dense network of distal processes that are probably functionally the most relevant part of the astrocyte. So, so um, in the same way that in neurons, there are dendrites, axons, and spines and cell bodies, and we think that, and we know that those different compartments play different functions. We think that in astrocytes, the different compartments play different functions, and this is not that clear, but we think that they are compartmentalized in, in different parts, and that the distal processes are comparable, perhaps, to the spines in neurons. So this is where the field stands now. To give you a sense of size, they are, they are relatively big cells, around 40 to 50 microns in diameter. And they have a little bit, they're not totally round, <coughs> excuse me, they're a little bit elongated, like uh, ellipsoid looking. Um, I want to give you a sense of the real data, how we get to these images. This is a stack taken from the brain. So this, I took it just going from the top of the peel vessels down around 200 microns step. And the, the, the images are really dirty. You see here the first plane are the astrocytes, and these are the peel vessels. And the notion I want to convey is that astrocytes are all, all over the place. You see they wrap, these are neurons, and sometimes there are vessels. So this notion that The neuropil is really uh, an astropil. They're all over the place. Uh, the last time I spoke to Paul, we, we go down and then there is less light. So the, the power of the laser doesn't work that well. But uh, astrocytes are all over the place. And Paul said, oh, the dark matter of the brain. I'm not sure they are dark. I don't think they're green either. They're probably whitish or yellowish, but they are all, all over the place. They wrap vessels, they wrap neurons, and I think this is a very important feature because it is probably, after the vascular system, the largest exchange surface in the brain. And when I mean exchange, exchange of molecules and information. So this is very, very important to understand about astrocytes, how they really wrap all the structures in the brain. Now, how do the distal processes look? It's, they are smaller than one micron. It's very difficult to see them. So we had serial block phase scanning electron microscopy, which is a very nice technique that allows us to generate high resolution 3D renditions of uh, small samples. This is from Baljit Ka. Uh, always, if I don't say it, the the origin of the image is in the slide. I think it's always very important to recognize who produced the data. And I want you to look at the yellow and blue images that we'll see now. So this is the astrocyte being reconstructed. Here it is. Those are the distal processes. And you will see that are highly convoluted. Now we have a high mag. You see how they look? Very convoluted, bulbous looking. So the, the idea, it, it's again the surface. This is like the spines of neurons, perhaps. So they can exchange a lot of information due to this very highly convoluted structure. Just a look. 
No, no difference. It's just different colors. So when we look with a traditional microscope here to the right, those distal processes wrap synapses. And in 1999, the concept was generated, the tripartite synapse. I'm sure perhaps you have heard about it, which I think is a little bit simplistic. It was mostly the coming of age of astrocytes as equal partner to neurons. But really now you will see that we think that it's mostly a multi part time, excuse me, synapse, the way the astrocytes interact with neurons. So with anatomy, we have the astrocytes are spread over the place. And second important feature, they are territorial. And this was shown by many people. This is from the Pegnik's lab in, in Stockholm. They injected different soluble fluorescent dyes manually in different astrocytes, and you get this kind of image. You see, yellow, you have the overlap. There's very, very little overlap. So the astrocytes, they really keep their territory separated. And uh, perhaps there, there are gap junctions, I will talk about them, that allow the, the exchange of potassium ions, but mostly they're, they separate their function. This is a very, very important feature. Within one astrocyte, there are a lot of neurons and synapses. So in a mouse, one given astrocyte has like 20 neurons, has up to 600 dendrites and up to 160,000 synapses. And in humans, one astrocyte can include up to 2 million synapses. So Halas in 2009 say all oh, astrocytes are synaptic outlines. The functional relevance of this is unknown. And ourselves, in the, in the paper we just submitted, we think that astrocytes should be considered many circuits. And we, um, we propose studies to understand how those tiles are organized like many circuits in, in the rest of the brain. But basically, we don't know what they do. This is a beautiful description of the tiles using the brain ball technique. Well, all the, the um, mice are genetically engineered to express different fluorescent dyes in cells. And here you see the tile arrangement. And the question is, first a standing question, what is the function of tiling in the, of the astrocytes? Second question, what is the molecular mechanism, a molecular person, what is the molecular mechanism that determines that astrocytes are so territorial? And we think that the territories are maintained by a very tight balance of repulsive signals. And we are working on this problem and we found, we, we, the idea came from a study that we did several years ago, it was published in PINAS in three years ago, where we studied the uh, topology of the astrocytes in mice. And the, the, the question was to determine whether plaques, and work also in neurodegenerative diseases, particularly Alzheimer's disease, where plaques were distorting the tiled arrangement of astrocytes and uh, whether the, the, the domains of the astrocytes were distorted in the disease in order to gain insight into this function that could contribute to memory impairment. So we did uh, this analysis using images from two photon microscopes. And this is the final material that we used to analyze. The astrocytes, the center of mass of the astrocyte is in green. The vessels are in red, stained with dextran, and the plaques are stained in blue with thioflavin. So this is a 3CD rendition of astrocytes. I think it's very important to understand that getting these images is not trivial. So it's not like we stay one morning and we get this image. We get really dirty materials to study. These are, this is the typical image. I change the colors because it's easier to do renditions we, when the important signal is in green and in red. So here the astrocytes would be in red and vessels in green. But the point I want to make that these are the raw data. And in our field, 
when we work in two photon, not only is a challenge to analyze the data, but to extract the, the positive data and discard the negative data or the false positives. And this is, this is very, very difficult. So in this study, I was lucky to collaborate with the Department of Physics of Boston University, and even the images were taken in uh, Mass General in Boston. And I don't want to go through the image processing. I just want to convey the notion that extracting astrocytes and only astrocytes is incredibly difficult. And the person, Will Morrison, a PhD student at Boston University, was really incredible in, in developing algorithms that could allow us to have these beautiful images where we did some mathematical analysis, the topology. This is just one example of the things we did. Uh, we, we were interested in understanding the distortion of topology in the presence of plaques, and, and Will decided, oh, okay. Will decided that it, a good way to start was with using a GR function, we, or the per correlation, which informs about forces between elements in a given volume, and, inf and informs about whether there is order, and informs about what, it, what kind of forces there are between the, the elements. So in this case, astrocytes were treated as particles. And this is apparently a very, a very basic analysis that was, has been used in physics and in, the, in Boston University and in, in Mass General in Boston, they use this analysis to determine microcolumns, to identify microcolumns of neurons in the brain. So it, it determines order from a set of analysis. So what it does is to compute the distance of all the objects to all the objects as compared to a random distribution. And if it that it reveals the probability of being in a given position as compared to, to a random particle. If GR is larger than one, there is attraction. If GR is lower than one, it means exclusion or repulsion. So we found repulsion, we found, we found exclusion. So the astrocyte topology fits like an exclusion model similar to a hard sphere liquid. The it looks like this is the parameterization of the data, looks like a hyperbole. And I just want to point out two features of the function. There is an outer limit, which is the, uh, an, an area of enhanced probability with, within which is the, the possibility of finding the nearest astrosa is it's, it's very high. But then the interesting area is x0 which is where the function reaches 50%, which is 18 macros. And I think this is interesting because the outer limit is actually probably the, the real size of the astrocyte size. It coincides very nicely with the, with the diameter of the astrocyte. This would be 40 from center of mass to center of mass, which equals to, the, to one diameter of an astrocyte. But the smaller, the inner limit, the 18, the exclusion zone, doesn't have any anatomical correlation. This is the beauty of using mathematics to analyze astrocytes or human data because it reveals things that you really don't see. So there is a, there is, we think now that there is a ring of some negative signals that are regulated by calcium around the astrocytes that the maximal the, 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 there is a gradient, and the, the gradient has its maximal expression at 18 microns from the center of mass. And negative signals like uh, efferents and synap I'm not sure you know, semaphrenes are relevant in, in neurons. So we think that astrocytes are releasing negative force signals to They're telling other astrocytes to stay away. And we are trying to identify what signals are those. But just that answer the question about the tiles. I think tiling in astrocytes is created by repulsive signals released from the astrocytes. Molecular profile. The, I think one of the most important breakthroughs in neurobiology in the last five years have been the capacity to isolate single cells from the brain because so far all the molecular analysis has been done with whole brains and which is sort of the average, the average pathway expression, and, and, and it's an artifact because it, the, 
the whole brain path pathways are inside cells, not distributed in the whole brain. And the first study that described single cell RNA sequencing was published three years ago in Science. And um, this has been the first study of very many. Now we have fax sorting, microfluidics technology, immunopanin, different techniques that allow us to isolate single cells and uh, cell populations from fresh tissues. So doing these from fixed tissues, like from, from brains, from patients, that's still challenging, but from fresh tissues, we can do it. In, in the, this study, the online is here, they took a little chunks from the somatosensory cortex, they digested that, they created a suspension, and then they cell culture in, in individual levels. So they cannot, and they're able to study individual cells. And they did clustering. I'm not sure if you, I'm sure you're familiar with clustering, which is an analysis of the puts together genes depending on their expression. The notion is that genes that carry similar functions, they are regulated in a similar fashion, probably by the same transcription factors, by the same operons. So they have the same level of expression. And statistically, we can find those genes and we can cluster them. And they did that and they found nine types of cells that were differentiated by a cell marker. Astrocytes are here with this marker. So this is, uh, this is the way of representation called TS in E. It's basically, it's very visual. So we have each dot is a cell, and then in red is the cell type that expresses this marker. But the most interesting thing was the, the uh, clustering, unbiased clustering of all those group of genes, because they revealed that, the, that there are 29 types of neurons and only two types of astrocytes. And that, I think, is very relevant because it means that neurons are more specialized than astrocytes. So astrocytes, I think, if we, if we look at anatomy, or we look at the uh, molecular profile, they are less specialized than neurons. Now in the field of astrocytes, people want to, to describe that astrocytes are heterogeneous. We want to make a big point that they really find different astrocytes in the rest of the brain. But I, I, do, I think that the main difference between neurons and astrocytes is that neurons are specialized and astrocytes are not. Therefore, probably they carry general functions of every, even the computational, the possible computational functions are general. This is an important point that has been revealed with molecular analysis. Well, this is just showing the, the neurons. There are like different classes, interneurons, pyramidal cells, but just all these neurons and all these astrocytes. So astrocytes are spongy form, they're territorial within their many circuits. We don't really know what those many circuits are doing, and I think they're non-specialized. Homeostasis, this is where the field has been working for the last 50 years, beautiful pieces of work. This summarizes just key findings. Astrocytes control pH, because they are able to pick out the CO2 from the neurons and transform it into carbonates and that brings back um, some necessary ions to the neurons. So neurons are here on the left, astrocytes on the right. Importantly, there is one notion called the lactate shuttle has been uh, somewhat controversial, but I think it still holds true. And this means that astrocytes provide lactate for neurons as a fuel. So the astrocytes pick up glucose from the blood and then up on demand, they, they provide lactate for neurons, which is a very, very highly efficient fuel. Um, astrocytes will participate in amino acid recycling. Very importantly, they also participate in glutamine and glutamate shuttle. So when the neurons release glutamate, the glutamate is taken up by the astrocytes which transform glutamine to glutamine and goes back to neurons. We also, in very importantly, potassium buffering. So astrocytes are very rich in, in different potassium channels and that 
absorbs, clears potassium after electrical activity. And I, I think this is where the gap changes are important for. So the, the potassium from one astrocyte is extruded to the blood through many different astrocytes. We also have uh, glutathione GCH production from astrocytes that goes to neurons metabolize and the, uh, the neurons are able to bring it back to glutathione. So astrocytes participate in neurotransmitter and ion clearance. They provide antioxidant protection. They control pH and they provide energy and energy fuel to neurons. That's, that is well established and I, I think that there is quite an agreement about that. But you will notice here something, this is a very interesting paper by the Maestretti lab, that neurons have mitochondria and astrocytes don't have mitochondria. So the field probably have heard that astrocytes are glycolytic, glycolytic and they, they, they just don't have mitochondria and neurons are oxidative. So this has been around the field forever and still there. It's not true. So we just published a paper where we did a gene set enrichment analysis, GSCA, comparing the mitochondrions of mouse and the human brains using a wealth of, of data from, from databases that are publicly, publicly available. And uh, what we did, well, Abel and Marina and Rousse, what they did was to take uh, proteins from mitochondria, the largest compendium of mitochondrion proteins, and they divided all these proteins into different functions. That was done by hand. And then we compare each function the expression of the nuclear genes encoding for mitochondrial proteins in many different databases. Here we, so we, I show three databases. This is the, the name of the first author. And uh, it's a heat map of the normalized enrichment scores. And just to point attention that in red, so in blue is genes that are highly expressed in neurons, functions that are highly expressed in neurons, and in red, functions that are highly expressed in astrocytes. And we have in astrocytes, lipid catabolism, fatty acid oxidation, and amino acid catabolism are highly expressed as compared to neurons. So the notion is that mitochondria can use two types of fuel, either pyruvate, which is what the neurons do, or they can use fatty acids or amino acids, which is what astrocytes do. And fatty acid oxidation which is all the pathways are here. So basically what fatty acids do is to provide acetyl-CoA for the Krebs cycle. I'm sure you're familiar with this because you come from the computational field. But one important notion is that fatty acid oxidation produces 50 times more ATP than glycolysis. So fatty acid, because uh, uh, an average uh, fatty acid, say palmitate has thin 16 carbons. So it goes around the, the uh, TCA 16 times. So it's very efficient in producing ATP. So the implication of this finding is that bold imaging, the, the blood oxygen level dependent imaging that has been used in neuroenergetics to understand brain function and is based on the idea that oxygen is only consumed by neurons is wrong, is wrong. So we need to revise those notions. So this is our outstanding question, two more. I'm very interested in myself to understand how astrocyte energy metabolism is adapted to brain function in different contexts, in uh, task-dependent activity, which is the typical paradigm in, in neuroenergetics. So uh, the animal or the people are, are doing something and the relevant brain area is illuminated. And also in during intrinsic brain activity when the brain has no outside input or during the day and the night. I do think the astrocytes are very circadian, so the astrocyte energy metabolism is adapted to, to sleep and uh, wake. So from a computational point of view, the energy, this is something uh, um, we read when we were writing the review, we read about the concept of energy efficient coding that was developed by Laughlin and David Adwell in 2001. And what they say is that since action potentials are energetically very demanding, energy supply 
it's a limiting factor for information processing in the brain. That's what they say. So you agree with this? You say, I should say, because they say, maybe I say, it's, oh, it's not true. It's true. So they say that the, the uh, neurons have developed strategies to deal with this energetic limitation like sparse coding. Sparse coding is that a given operation is distributed, is shared by different neurons to diminish the computational load and hence the energy use. So that's a fact. So we are thinking that perhaps childs have a, are a, a very good design to facilitate energy supply into neurons. So that the, that the function of astro is actually is good use of energy. So that I want to study this in, in, in silicon, some models, but I think the energy, the energy phenomenon, the, requ the requirements of energy may be the factors that determine that astrocytes are in tiles and have many different neurons inside. So this is a lead that we want to follow. And perhaps you can express your opinion if we are, is this interesting or not? So just to finish with homeostasis before getting into behavior, um, the, the, I think one of the most interesting things mm, described in the last years from the Niga, <coughs> excuse me, from the Nidegar lab is the, the presence of the glymphatic system. Just very, very simply, what they describe is a way that the brain uses to eliminate waste. And the way it goes here is that the CSF follows what they call a para-arterial pathway. So just outside, so we have here the arteries and there are solids coming through the walls and through convective flow, they are pushed through the astrocytes. So astrocytes have a barrier here, and molecules in astrocytes like equiparins are of control what goes through the parenchyma to the venous system and then is cleared by the glymphatic system. So this is a very recent finding, and I think it's very relevant. And it's relevant because it happens let me see if I can find it. Ah, it works. You see here in the, on the top is two photon imaging that was used to demonstrate this concept using fluorescent tracers. Then this is the rendition in red, the arteries, the peel arteries on the top of the brain, and then the, the peel that is going through the parenchyma. And in green is the direction of the molecules or the tracers in this case. And the, here is the rendition of what happens here. And you will see that when the green red trend goes through the astrocytes, through the, uh, through the venous system. Let me see if I can just go to the next one here. So this is important because it happens at night so the astrocytes change, and I talk about circadian regulation of astrocytes. So astrocytes are different during the day, during the night. So it happens at night mostly. And this is now the theory is that one of the functions of sleep is to clear waste out of the brain. And this is why it's important to, to sleep the right amount of hours. What? So waste, amyloid beta, tau, hyperphosphorylate tau, things, molecules that when they are released by the brain, everything is actually, everything that is released by the brain eventually makes it to the CSF and to the blood, but are things that when accumulated, like amyloid beta or hyperphosphate tau or alpha-synuclein, they precipitate. So the notion is now that in a, this is a, there would be a schematic, a normal young person. In an old person, and in Alzheimer's disease, the molecules, particularly beta amyloid has been shown, get stuck in the brain because the glymphatic system, here you see, the paravascular flow is impaired, it is slower, and then it deposits in the vessels and causes cerebral amyloid angiopathy and probably facilitates that amyloid beta and hyperphosphorylate tau uh, give rise to plaques and to neurofibrillary tangles. This is an important concept that we speak about homeostasis of astrocytes you need to learn. 
So in summary, homeostasis, I talk about the glymphatic system, metabolic coupling to, between astrocytes and neurons, neurotransmitter and ion clearance. That's the summary. So getting in, into the systems neuroscience like studies. So first, I think for calcium, it, it's a lot of data. So I tried to summarize the, the key points. I said it's a, it's a real time functional readout of astrocytes for the last 30 years. It is cytosolic calcium I'm talking about, and is the result of very complex interorganelle of fluxes. The method we have used to study calcium signaling in astrocytes is imaging. And it has very complex spatial temporal dynamics. This is one of the outstanding questions in the field to understand what does it mean. And very importantly, from the point of view of computation, it's a slow signal relative to action potentials. So the responses range from hundreds of milliseconds to tens of seconds. Hundreds of milliseconds from the time they see the, the stimulus to the, to the time that the calcium transient lasts. So this is our range of action. About the fluxes, uh, calcium usually is increasing the cytosol after some neurotransmitters, glutamate, acetylcholine, ATP, activates G receptors, and there are well, well known second messenger. A very important one is the IP3 mediated that extrudes calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum or from the RYR receptor. We also have calcium coming out of the lysosome, stimulated by a second messenger called NAATP. Calcium can be released and taken out by the mitochondria too, can, be, can come from the outside through plasma channels can be extruded with some pumps. So this, this is a very, very complex interplay of fluxes that control how much calcium is increased in the saddle soil and the duration of the response, just to get a sense. So calcium imaging has been possible because of calcium indicators. So there are two big families, the FURA2, which are so bulk indicators, the first ones used in the, in the, uh, in the field. And the beauty of these, of these molecules, that's erythiometric, meaning it has a dual uh, excitation, a dual emission. And what, the, the ratio of emission and excitation changes depending on whether FURA is, has calcium or not. And this is very interesting from experimental point of view because it eliminates the confounding factor of the amount of FURA that is in a given cell that is very highly variable and it gets quenched. The other set of molecules are the, the so-called genetically encoded indicators, genetically encoded because they are in plasmids that are transduced in a cell specific, specific manner with viruses or transgenic tools. And basically they are FRED based and they are composed by uh, fluorescent proteins, usually the green fluorescent protein or another type, and a calcium binding protein like calmodulin or uh, tropomyosin. And what happens is that when calcium binds the structure, there is an allosteric change and the spectrum of emission changes and we see that calcium has been increased in the cell that expresses the indicator. So those are our tools. This is a video from Abel in my lab. It's, it's five minutes that have been reduced to 30 seconds for, yeah, for the sake of time. And so it's 10 frames per second, but so it's highly speed up. The responses are two astrocytes. This is in hippocampus, confocal microscope, and the GCAMP P6, a very useful genetically encoded indicator. Two astrocytes, and you will see that we have two types of responses. These are spontaneous. So their astrocytes are always having signaling of astrocytes. We don't know what it means. And now they respond to ATP. It comes. That produces a 
why the response, and our neurojournaling that produces a match why the response. Phenylephrine is an agonist of uh, neuroadrenergic receptors. So we have we have a spontaneous signaling that and two modalities, local in different parts of the astrocyte that we call microdomains or global that encompasses all the astrocyte. And I want to show you data from Amit Agarwal, who probably has the most beautiful images and analysis of a calcium. This is with another calcium. This is the, what I, I show first, well, yeah, all the microdomains. So this is just one astrocyte with a genetically encoded indicator that binds to membrane is highly sensitive. And you will see first spontaneous. See, once in a while you have microdomains that are firing. So I want to show you this kind of images because I want you to understand what kind of signals we are working with. TTX is important because those are not dependent on neuronal activity. That's the point that, that we want to make. So they happen. So astrocyte is like a recurrent circuit then that produces kind of signals. We don't understand why. This is a glutamate agonist. Did you see the signals are enhanced? They're still territorial. And I will have again neurogenaline, which produces the large modality of calcium responses in astrocytes. Neurogenaline now does it. So the way to analyze it is still not clear. Let me see. So what Amit does is to record those microdomains individually. So at each time point, they count how many domains are activated. And you see how it changes over time and with the stimuli. Neurogenaline, you will see now it's all it implicates more domains than anything else. So now question is how to analyze this? This is where the field stands. So some people, particularly when we use FURA, they just take one signal from the whole astrocyte, it's like an intuitive and fire neuron. It's just one calcium signaling from the whole astrocyte with no recognition about the compartmentalization of that signaling. Some people take the microdomains and the average intensity at different times. Some people go a little bit more refined and they, they measure the microdomains in different areas of the astrocytes, in the primary processes, secondary processes, in the distal processes, but the, I don't think this is very sophisticated. So now we need a better way to analyze it. So it goes from my, my fifth question. And uh, with Ruben moreno Botte, we are starting a project where we consider that all those microdomains are multidimensional data and therefore they could be analyzed with some tools that he has, including dimensionality reduction. The idea is to find what microdomains are relevant and independent in a given behavior. I will talk about behaviors in, in a minute, but that's the idea. Try to simplify the data using dimensionality reduction. And the, and the implicit notion is that astrocytes are dynamical systems governed by function-specific regimes resulting from coordinated changes in calcium signaling. So that's, that's the notion. And we want to find if there are, what are the regimes associated to 
different behaviors, the same way that you have different res neuronal responses associated to different stages of a given task. We want to understand if astrocytes, individual astrocytes and astrocyte populations, they do have specific patterns of calcium responses associated to behavior. So this is what we're working now with Ruben. So behavior, I talked about the astrocytes uh, mediating behavior. And I want to give you the, uh, a general sense. I cannot talk about many studies. This is the summary. So there are two types of studies. There are studies where a given task has, well, well you were asking, sorry, I don't know your name, but you were asking about this before. When a given task is stimulating calcium imaging astrocytes, there are a plethora of studies that show astrocytes respond to, to different stimuli during behavior. And more recently, there are studies where astrocytes are manipulated, either with transgenic tools or with chemogenetics and with optogenetics. And these studies show by blocking or modulating some aspect of astrocytes, usually calcium, that astrocytes participate in the behavior because they see changes in the, in the behavior. So they, they show causal relationships between calcium activity in astrocytes and some behaviors. So as to behavior, which is a very general term, but mostly has been shown in sensory processing in, in mice. So whisker stimulation, somatosensory stimulation, uh, visual stimulation in the visual cortex. So when the mouse are exposed to visual stimuli, astrocytes respond differently by way of calls and signaling. Brain state transitions, fear, also, uh, I will talk about that. Neuromodulation has been shown that the locus ceruleus and the nucleus basalis of Minard uh, activate astrocytes and they, astrocytes transduce those signals in the cortex. So if calcium is eliminated from the astrocytes because, um, for instance, in mice that lack the IP3 receptor 2, then the locus ceruleus or the nucleus basalis of Minard cannot transduce signals to the cortex, so it plays a role in neuromodulation. Memory too, learning, um, and memory acquisition and learning, the astrocytes participate in that, and homeostatic reflexes like pH regulation, breathing, and food intake. So they, there are a lot of papers, you, could, you want to read more, we can, you can read our review, but there are reviews, so the field has been wor working on this for the last 10 years, and there's a lot of data. So I just want to, to describe three papers to give you a sense of the data and the tools that we use for the sensory processing. The, this is from Stover, was published in 2018 because they used uh, a very interesting calcium indicator that is faster, so allows us to detect signals earlier. And uh, this is the workflow, craniotomy. I, I showed you already how we do cranial windows in mice. They, they inject viruses that label astrocytes and neurons. It is, I think, a mask now to record activity in calcium neurons at the same time. Here is a calcium indicator in neurons. So they didn't measure action potentials, they measure calcium. They went to a two photon images and they recorded in two channels. So green, blue is astrocytes and sort of magenta, this fuchsia color is the neurons. So see if the video works. Just look at the here, the merge. This is when the whisker comes. I don't know if you picked that up. The whisker stimulation. Just look here, I'll repeat it. Normal, spontaneous. Now it's whisker stimulation that promotes calcium upregulation in neurons and astrocytes. And the process of this data. I think there's an interesting paper because it, it really describes that astrocytes are relatively slow signal when we talk about calcium transits. In here, in dark, are the calcium responses in neurons, and in green are the calcium responses in astrocytes, and you see two things. First, they're always lagging behind neurons. The onset of latency is here in the milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds for neurons. neurons Neuro, neuronal calcium, it's a response to action potential, so it mirrors 
the uh, shape of a, of a spike, but it really is very fast and goes up and down. And you see astrocytes, they're slower, and the peak here, peak latency, is around 10 seconds. So hundreds of milliseconds to tens of seconds is the time scale of astrocytes. When we talk about calcium signaling, it will we want to include astrocytes in neural <coughs> circuits. The, the second study I want to talk about is the uh, brain state. This is from Kira Poscancer and Rafael Juste. Kira is one of the authors in the review we submitted. And uh, the key finding here is that optogenetic stimulation of astrocytes using an opsin called arc rhodopsin promotes a switch to the slow oscillation state by triggering the upstate of slow waves. That, that, that's the finding. Now, a word on optogenetics in astrocytes, we don't really know how it works because astrocytes are not electrically excitable like neurons. So it's not clear how channel rhodopsin that promotes entrance of sodium, potassium, and calcium at trace levels produce, produces an increase in calcium transients in the cytosol. And it's not clear how er Archerodopsin, which hyperpolarizes cells and in neurons it inhibits neurons, in astrocytes it produces calcium transients, particularly in the, in the processes. So it is not known. We know that optogenetics activate astrocytes, but we do not really understand well the mechanisms. And this is the setup. In this case, the measure local field potential. Again, this is very important to to record neurons and astrocytes at the same time. And they, they use mice where they inject, in this case, GCAM P6. We don't think they inject, I think there's a transgenic mice, a cray mice. Well, GCAM P6 is here. You see the kind of images that they get. And then Keto selects ROIs. She, what she does is that she selects several ROIs in, in the process of the astrocytes. And these are the traces of the ROIs, just to give you a sense of the raw data again. So when looking at the local field potential, if we blow out this stretch, like every five minutes, at least I think this is like five minutes, they see a state transition. So we go from desynchronized to synchronized to slow oscillations that are, sorry, this is wrong. It's less than one earth. There's a mistake here. It's less than one earth slow oscillations that Mavi Sanchez Diaz says, things that are default emerging activity in neural circuits that are predominant in, in a slow way of sleep and under anesthesia. So this is the basic observation. In state transitions in a mouse, like uh, every, every five minutes. Now, what Kira does is to uh, stimulate the astrocytes using optogenetics. So in, in addition to GCAM P6, the astrocytes express archerodopsin. So the, the setup is five, a five second stimulation that produces calcium increases. She shows that in the paper. And then she checks for five minutes. And the finding is that this stimulation provokes the brain transition to the more synchronized state. And this is the key data. This is the the recording, these are the spectrograms with the power in the uh, high frequency and the low frequency. And there are low here, the traces of power in low and high frequency bands. And this is the key finding. The power in the low frequency is increased upon optogenetic stimulation of the astrocytes. So the last paper, because it's, I mean, you see, we are already one hour and, and I, <laughs> I have uh, like 10 more slides, but I'm not going to describe them. So I guess, because I want you to show the key papers in the field. There are very many, but I have selected a few ones that are, that are really important. This is from Alfonso Araque, is one of the leaders of calcium signal and astrocytes, and has produced beautiful data about the relationship between astrocytes and behavior. And this is with chemogenetics. So the key finding of this paper is that the chemogenetic stimulation of astrocytes in the amygdala changes the excitation and vision balance and reduces fear expression. So in the paper by Kira, we spoke about network regulation. And in the paper of Arakes, we speak about control of local circuits. So the amygdala is here. 
it's, it's relatively complex and it has lateral and central and the circuit includes glutamatergic neurons in red and includes also GABAergic neurons in, in blue. And what Araki finds is that when they stimulate astrocytes with chemogenetics, the astrocytes activate the GABAergic neurons and inhibit the glutamatergic neurons. And the result is that the expression of fear is reduced. So that, that's the finding. And they... What were the neurons they were activating? They activate the glutamatergic... A little before, they, they activate... The, the astrocytes activated a certain neuron type and they then activate the glutamatergic cells. You were saying no, no, they do. L look at here. Paul, look at here. So you have the astrocyte is stimulating the GABAergic transmission and is inhibiting the glutamatergic transmission. And then the, mecha the mechanism, well, they figure out ATP, but since probably you are serious people, you want to see their, their, the data. <laughs> so this is the uh, injection of the tools in the threads, the chemogenetic in, in the mouse, in the amygdala, showing that they are expressing GFAP here showing that here, this is a very important piece of data, they use FUDA2, they then use here the genetically encoded indicators, but they show that with, when they stimulate, with C and O, when they stimulate the, uh, when they do the actual chemogenetic stimulation, calcium is increased, specifically in astrocytes, this is an important control, and this is, shows the peak, and shows that it's specific for the administration of the CNO, and this is the, the relative different regulation of different transmissions. In blue, stimulation of the uh, inhibitory neurotransmission, and in red, inhibition of excitatory neurotransmission. So this is a very fine example of, of, of where the field stands. So the astrocyte modulation can control local circuits and network circuits. That's where we are. So outstanding questions that the ones I posed in the beginning. So you think that astrocytes compute beyond providing metabolic and hemostatic support to neurons? And do you think that astrocytes encode by way of calcium transients? So with Ruben, we will have proposed to use decoders, the same decoders that he uses to to code the neuronal activity in complex behavior decision making. So we are thinking about doing the, the same kind of paradigm and looking at recording in astrocytes at the same time and use decoders to see if we can correlate some changes in, in, in correlate patterns of calcium responses with some behavioral output just with the overarching goal of determine if astrocytes are coding for any variables or not. So this is in the making. And if the encodes, what they encode. That's, those are important questions that probably will be answered in the last, in the next 10 years. No, I'm sure. So, we, we, so this is like we are now here. We know nothing. And we will, the point with Ruben is to try to use tools for machine learning to analyze astrocyte signals and to see if we can get interesting information out of it. That's, that's exactly the point where we're at. So I think we finished because it's already one and a half. And I was talking to therapeutics, but I'm not, so. Well, say a few words about therapeutics, out of Oh, therap well, because it's, it's, too, it's too long. It's too long to go fast. So basically, so without the slide. Oh, without slide. The so slide. therapeutics. So the notion is that this idea was that when the brain gets sick, it's only neurons, it's wrong. It's just totally wrong. So astrocytes suffer diseases. It's also wrong the notion that astrocytes and macroglia kill neurons. That's totally simplistic. And we need to understand with molecular, that's what we do in the lab, with molecular analysis, we need to understand what are the functional changes in the astrocytes. And I, we know from Alzheimer's disease here, just to make a long story short, like uh, in neurons, in Alzheimer's disease, this is GSCA gene set enrichment analysis. 
control and load range, down means downregulated, up is normal. All these neurotransmission related genes are downregulated. This is non Alzheimer's disease. Neurotransmission is impaired, spines are decreased. So we bring up the notion that astrocytes are impaired too. Um, we find impairment in specific functions. One, mitochondria. So the electron transport is impaired, fatty acid oxidation is increased. It would impair from the molecular point of view. We don't know if it's impaired. So the gene ex the expression of the genes related to that function is changed. We still don't know because we don't have access to the brains, unfortunately. So doing molecular analysis, it's a way to try to get insight into function, but eventually we need to confirm our hypothesis with the real samples. But according to the expression, mitochondrial functions are altered. The lysosomal system is altered. And that's at the level of gene expression, yeah. and not of the machinery of the glia itself. So the gene expression. So we're talking about the because we have a way. We since we cannot isolate so far cells from living humans, we have developed a method to extract cell-specific signatures from whole brain transcriptomes. And so so far, we know that the transcriptomes are altered, and usually. Uh, Alterations of the transcriptomes are a telltale of a functional alteration. So it, it's an indication that that pathway is, is wrong. So, so far, neuronal pathways are downregulated and astrocyte pathways are also dysfunctional. We have other models, traumatic brain injury, where we do similar analysis, and we see that key genes that control functions of astrocytes are also downregulated, meaning that astrocyte functions are impaired. What happens in disease is that cells suffer a phenotypical change, and this is very important. So it's not just one protein that upregulated, downregulated. It is a phenotypical change, and the therapeutical consequence is that we need drugs that promote th phenotypical changes in the cells. Therefore, we need systems biology in order to develop drugs that are able to have a whole, promote a whole change in the astrocytes. And one thing we're doing is to use artificial intelligence with axonomics, I don't know if you know this company, and we have already, we are preparing a patent, uh, so I'm gonna talk about details, where we, using this molecule analysis, we're able to build, or I say way they are able to build protein to protein interactomes, and they're able to find drugs using silico screens that regulate nodes and transform a sick astrocyte into a healthy astrocyte. So this is the whole, Im this is the implication of doing molecular analysis in cell, in specific cell types in the brain that eventually we can develop drugs that target that cell specifically. And this is exactly what we're doing now. Cool, very good. Well, thank you, Elena. You're welcome.